Good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, I'm, let me first say, start by saying I'm a proud alum of Colton High School. And back in, I graduated in 1984, probably uh, long after some of you uh, uh, were even born. Or, uh, and I had the opportunity to be a principal here for quite some time. And, um, you know, now serving in my role as superintendent, uh, one of our biggest priorities is to make sure that we provide all students with the opportunities to be college or career ready. And throughout my tenure, uh, and throughout my tenure as a principal here at Colton High School, sometimes those opportunities don't exist for all students for a variety of reasons, because of the backgrounds, because of certain life experiences they go through. And it kind of reminds me of a young man that I met while I was principal here at the high school by the name of Michael. And Michael was, he was a good kid uh, for the most part, and I would classify Michael as being your classic knucklehead. He was a good kid. He wasn't trying to hurt anybody, but he paid more attention to other things than his academics. He was more interested in his friends. He was more interested in other things that were going on outside of the classroom. He had parents, uh, two parents, but they were uh, construction workers, blue-collar workers, and um, his father worked in the day, came home at night, and his mom had to go to uh, an evening job because somebody had to stay home and take care of, of the kids. Michael had two older brothers and sisters that were 10 and 11 years older than him, so he basically had two sets of parents. And so as Michael entered his ninth grade uh, year into Colton High School, um, it was at a time when he was kind of, uh, searching, searching for what the purpose of his, of, of his life was going to be. And I remember uh, he lived right up the street, just a few blocks away. And at that time I was principal here, there were no fences around this campus. And so the bell would ring. We would be out on campus like your administration is today, making sure kids would get into class. And from afar, I could see a group of students running across the field over here along the baseball field. And sure enough, it was Michael. And, of course, the bell had rang, so we swept all the kids at that time into a study hall room, put them in the room for first period until the bell rang, and then they would go on to the next period. And day after day, I can remember Michael falling into that category, to that system, that cycle of tardiness. And it wasn't just first period, it was second period because you'd find him out talking to a group of friends or some girls trying to get their attention, messing around, acting like knuckleheads. And I remember seeing girls looking at him and just giving him the look of like, get away, you know, I got to go to class. And so as uh, Michael evolved into, uh, he moved on into um, his sophomore year, I remember seeing him at uh, one of the football practices. And I'm like, okay, good. This is good. You know, he's got something that is interesting in him. He has a, a group of friends that are going to keep him in check and keep him focused. And maybe this is the year that he's going to turn around. And so I'd go out, watch him, watch some games, expecting to see Michael out on the field and playing. And, and he, he, instead of being on the field and playing, he was standing on the sideline with a helmet in his hand and uh, just watching the game. He was, he was an athlete. He wasn't a good athlete, but he was an athlete. And um, he played football. He played baseball. He wrestled. He was good enough to make the team, but never, never good enough for the starting position. And as Michael's experience in high school started to continue, I remember walking down uh, one of the halls, the 200 wing, one afternoon or one early morning, and I see Michael out of the side of my eye, and he's walking with a young lady holding her hand. And I'm like, ooh, I'm going to go say hi. I'm going to give him, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make him feel a little uncomfortable. So as I approach Michael, I, I approach the two, and I, I uh, see them holding hands, and I say, hey, Michael, what's up? And he goes, nothing, Mr. Omdars, with this big smile on his face and this cute little girl standing right next to him holding hands. I said, what are you guys up to? He says, nothing, just going to class. And I said, okay, hurry up and go. The bell's going to ring. So I open the door, expecting the young lady to walk into her class and then Michael to go on his way. But instead, what I see is Michael, and his girlfriend, as they're holding hands, enter the classroom. And I'm going, wait, 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 wait. Michael, what are you doing? And he goes, I'm going to class. And I said, but this isn't your class. He goes, yes, it is, with this big smile on his face. 
And I'm like, you guys are taking the same class, your boyfriend and girlfriend are taking the same class, and he's with his smile of, uh, of happiness on his face says, yes, we're in the same class. So in a, in a, in a, in a, uh, a moment of shock, I close the door and I just stand there and I reflect and thinking, okay, I wonder how this is going to turn out. And as expected, uh, the semester ended and uh, I happened to see Michael and his girlfriend uh, sitting out on the uh, benches over here for lunch. And I come up to him, I said, how, how did the class go? And the girl says, oh, great, I got to be. And I said, Michael? And he just sh shook his head and I said, Michael, I said, how did the class go? And he goes, I failed it. And I just shook my head, looked at him, and I said, okay. I said, what are you going to do now? And he says, I guess I'm going to have to take it, in, uh, take it again in summer school. And I said, all right. You take it again in summer school. And so that summer comes and Michael... Uh, goes on to summer school, and now he's got to take a semester course, and he's got to crunch it into a two-week time period. And Michael, being the knucklehead that he is and more interested in having fun and hanging out with his friends, ends up taking this two-week summer school English course that is uh, a semester long, now packed into two weeks. And not to my surprise, Michael fails it again. And now Michael's sitting there with this look of disgust on his face, as he reflects on the, the time period that he was in this one class that he failed twice, that now what, what was he going to do? He's enter, entering his junior year, and now um, he's in danger of not graduating. So um, he, he goes and he um, continues um, school. He ends up uh, towards the end of his senior year meeting all of the graduation requirements. I run him to him at the quad over here. He, him and his group of friends stood up against the wall, perched like a bird on a tree, looking at everybody else, looking back and forth. And I remember walking up to them. Toward, it was about May, or, uh, around May, April or May, when the students were getting their acceptance letters to, to colleges. And everybody around him has pieces of paper in his hands and they're smiles on their faces and they're talking to each other, showing each other the piece of paper and what it was is they were showing them where the, where the schools that they got accepted to. And I see Michael there just standing with a stoic face, listening to all these conversations around him and I walked up to him and I said, hey Michael, what's up? Where'd you go? Where are you going? And he just doesn't say a word and he nods his head. He says, I'm not going anywhere. And I, he just had this look of depression on his face and I was really worried at that time for him because Everybody around him was a lot more focused than he was. So I walked him down to the counselor's office and had him sit down with the counselor because he didn't know what he was going to do. And I was afraid he would do something really uh, stupid. And they sat down with the counselor and the counselor says, what can I do for you? And I told the counselor, I said, well, you know, Michael is interested in going to college. Can you please look at his transcripts and see what opportunities he has? And she looks at Michael, and Michael's looking down on the ground. Um, and she goes, Michael, is that, is that what you want to do? And he goes, yes. And so she pulls up Michael's transcripts, looks at the transcripts, and you just hear, huh. And I'm waiting, I'm thinking, and I'm hoping the huh is, here's an opportunity that we can take advantage of. And the next words out of her mouth was, you should have thought about that your ninth grade year because you failed English twice. You were not able to take your A through G courses that are required to get accepted into a four-year university. Son, I'm sorry. You can't go to a four-year university. And Michael already being as deflated as he was, was even more deflated. And then she says, but you have an opportunity to attend our community college, which is right down the street. Would you like me to register you for that? And he said, yes. So the counselor takes time. She ends up enrolling and registering Michael into uh, classes at uh, Valley College right down the street. And Michael gets to Valley College his first day. And at that time, it's not public school. It's not high school. Valley College, there's no security or campus supervisors. There's no parents. There's no teachers at the doors telling you to go to class. Michael gets to the first day of class in the morning. He sits down not knowing anybody and then starts to see a friend come down the hallway and Michael calls him over and says, hey, come and sit down here. And then his friend says, hey, there's Josh. Josh, get over here. And Josh comes over 
And then the next thing you know, before the beginning of the first class at Valley College, Michael surrounded by six or seven of his buddies from Colton High School. But they were all buddies that did not get acceptance letters to four universities. They were all buddies that were part of that cycle of his little uh, clan that spent more time worrying about other things than academics. And so the first day of class at college, one of his friends said, Hey, Michael, let's go to Baker's. Let's get something to eat before we go to our first period of class. And Michael says, Let's go. And that group of boys goes across the street, right across the street from Valley College into Baker's. It's busy. It's in the morning. Everybody's getting their food before they go to work or go to class. Before you know it, by the time they get their food, they're sitting down, they're eating. It's about 15, 20 minutes into the first period. And then Michael's friend says, hey, we missed first period. Let's, let's just go to second period. So everybody says, okay, let's go to second period. And so second period would come. They'd go to second period. And then by that time, it would be lunchtime. And then one of his other friends would say, hey, let's go down the street. Let's get in our cars and go have some lunch. And everybody would say, all right, let's go. And they'd go have lunch. And then he'd miss his next period after lunch. And that cycle for Michael repeated itself over and over and over again. And I'd mentioned earlier that Michael's parents, one was a, his father was a construction worker and his mom was an assembly line worker for a medical facility out here in Riverside. She worked graveyard, his father worked during the day. But he was a construction worker. So when the weather was bad, his dad would have to go home because they couldn't work in the rain in the, on the construction sites. So one day, Michael gets up to go to, to, go to class at Valley College, and uh, it's raining really bad. And that cycle of missing first period, of going to lunch, of maybe going to third period, and then going to fourth period, but not listening to the teacher and what the content of the class is, repeated itself over and over again. And on this one day, he comes, he comes home, and he notices his dad's work car in the driveway. And he doesn't think anything of it. It's raining. His dad is typically home on rainy days. And he opens the door, and there standing at the, in the hallway waiting for him to step one foot in that house was his dad with a piece of paper in his hand. And his dad had the look of terror on his face. And Michael looks up in, 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 in confusion and said, Hey, Dad, what's up? What's going on? And his dad has this piece of paper in his hand, and he says, What's this? And Michael says, What's what? Well, the piece of paper that his dad got because he didn't go to work that one day that he just happened to get home by the time the mail was delivered was a piece of paper from the, uni from the community college, from Valley College, that let Michael know he was placed on academic probation for about six different reasons. And he looked at Michael and he says, what's this? And Michael said, what? And his youthful teenage rage started to get angry at his dad for getting angry at him. And he started to argue with his dad, in a sense saying, you know, I got this, how dare you question me? I'm working hard, going to school, trying to, get, trying to better myself to be something other than a construction worker. And his dad lost it. His dad said, you know what? All I asked you to do was to go to school, get good grades. I'm paying for your school, I'm paying for your books, I'm paying for your food, I'm paying for your car. And that's what you're going to tell me? Get out. And Michael sees his mom in the kitchen cooking dinner like she normally does before she goes to work for the family. And Michael's like every other family from the community where, um, you know, mothers provide the unconditional love. And every time a, a, a situation like this happened with Michael, Michael knew he could always go to his mom and his mom was all, would always support him. But this one day when Michael ran to his mom as she was cooking, he noticed that she was not engaging in the conversation where she typically would engage. She turns around and she tells Michael to get out. And Michael leaves. He grabs his stuff and he leaves. And he drives around the town. And he ends up here in the parking lot. There, there used to be a parking lot here where the science wing was. And I just happened to be meeting uh, as a principal. My office was right there. I just happened to be meeting with a pastor. We walk out to the parking lot as we're leaving and ending that meeting and we notice Michael sitting on the, in a car with his head on the steering wheel. So we go up, we knock on the door, he rolls down the window and we say, hey Michael, what's going on? And Michael looks up with tears in his eyes and he says, I don't know. I don't know what to do. 
And I said, Michael, this had been years after he graduated. The pastor says, what's wrong, young man? And Michael says, I don't know. I, I don't know what to do. I just, my parents just kicked me out of the house. And so there was a few words were exchanged, and they had a little conversation. And then the pastor finally realizes what's going on, and he tells Michael, stick out your hand, young man. And Michael looks at him in confusion and, and looks at me, and I'm going... He says, stick out your hand, young man. So Michael sticks out his hand like he's going to shake the pastor's hand. The pastor says, now get your other hand, reach around and pull yourself out because nobody's going to get you out of this but you. And Michael is just, he's looking through us and not at us at that point because he's trying to process what the pastor said. And the, pa the last thing the pastor said is, don't, don't think that your second chance can't be your last chance you never know and Michael has a little small talk they, they end the conversation and he takes off and I don't see Michael for for a number of years and then I get a knock on my door right outside my office because the parking lot was right next to the office the principal's door and it, I open the door and it's Michael and he, he looks great he's very professional he has uh, he's dressed nice and then I said Michael what's going on he goes, Mr. Amadars, I'm just here to update you on what's happened since the last time we talked in the parking lot. I said, come on in. Tell me what's going on. He goes, well, I went on to Chafee Community College. I graduated with my AA degree. I crossed, when I crossed that stage, I couldn't believe the look on my parents' face and how proud they were in tears that their only, their, one of their, their, ch their only child had graduated from college. They have three. Their only child has graduated from college. I felt so proud. I went on to Cal State San Bernardino and I got my bachelor's of arts in business and finance. And then from there, I was so proud of myself and I was so happy that it made my parents so proud. I went on to University of Redlands and I graduated from University of Redlands with my, master, with my degree in uh, uh, master's of arts degree. And he goes, now I'm in charge of an organization that services five different cities that employs and has uh, uh, people of over 22,000. I'm responsible for a budget of over $250 million. And I said, wow, Michael, that's great. What made you change? And he says it was all, it was what that pastor said in that parking lot. It stuck with me for the rest of my life and I thought I gotta, I gotta do something different. I said, what did he say? He said, you got to be careful because you never know when your second chance is going to be your last chance. He says, Mr. Almadars, things could have very easily went in the wrong direction. And that's why I did what I did. Now, there's one thing I didn't tell you. Michael is his middle name. His full name is Jerry Michael Almadares, and he's the superintendent of Colton Joint Unified School District. Thank you.